thank you, uh, Gabriel, for that very generous introduction. Um, I also, let me start by uh, thanking the organizer for the kind invitation. It, it's been wonderful these past two days uh, seeing about this beautiful town of uh, Croatia. And I learned a lot about the culture too, and particularly enjoying the success of the Croatian soccer, national football team. Uh, hopefully, after my talk, they will beat Denmark as well. Um, okay, with that, uh, let, <laughs> let me also acknowledging, so I, I, you know, I usually run out of time at the end, so the, today the presentations primarily uh, uh, works done by two of my doctoral students. One is Dr. Huang, another one is Kenny Lowe, both of whom just graduated and, and move on. Uh, uh, currently doing their postdocs, one at Harvard Medical School, another one at the at Chinese University of Hong Kong. And also my talk are uh, funded by um, those institutions. And starting, I mean, I, in the process of preparing my, uh, my presentation, I was uh, struck by the fact that much of the human data, so I was given the task to review uh, epidemiology data, but the way that I see epidemiology is all study of distribution and determinants in human population. So I usually don't classify them or, or distinguish them between randomized trial versus post practice cohort. Obviously, I classify them along uh, the rank of quality of the study. So naturally, prospective cohort and randomized uh, intervention trial are at the top of the pyramids. And I was reminded by this editorial I did literally 15 years ago. Uh, after a series of what I believe high quality, high quality prospective cohort studies along with a set of uh, randomized intervention trial data at the times so are already available that guide us forward. That was 15 years ago. In fact, unfortunately, much of the, aside from the small scale randomized uh, feeding trial looking at some of the soft endpoints, really has not made much progress in the field. Now, particularly concerning oak intakes. And that's, you know, really ought to let our uh, uh, community get together to think hard about how we can truly uh, make progress in this space. So with that, I cut to the chase immediately uh, helping you to summarize what uh, we have learned since. For obesity, we found insignificant weight reductions in small randomized trial. Summarized um, uh, here, essentially you can see the findings was pretty minimal because of the very fact of those small duration and small size of the population. Aside from our own independent cohort st uh, studies, we have done, again, a very first um, randomized, a uh, very first meta-analysis summarized those findings and subsequently confirmed by others. Now we have a total of 26 RCTs. In terms of dyslipidemia, the effect was actually quite significant, and this is actually consistent between randomized trial and prospective cohort studies. For uh, weight change, uh, we were in fact using the nurses' house study, the first to actually model significant changes in intake level because we do have multiple measurements of whole grain, which including oatmeal intakes as well as cooked uh, oats. Uh, intakes in the, using the food frequency questionnaire and prospectively related to change in uh, body weights. And, and again, subsequently have been confirmed by three or four prospective cohort studies now. In terms of diabetes, we did one of the first diabetes study. This is based on uh, also the nurses' health study published in AJPH. Subsequently, now we have a total of 19 prospective cohort studies now. This is talking about clinical diabetes uh, as opposed to glycemic controls. In small scale RCTs, all you can look at is glycemia, either fasting glucose or postprandial glucose. And in general, the effects has been small. It depends on how you see it in terms of short term, but prospectively with 
day in and day out some of the premises is that foot frequency questionnaire can capture a uh, long-term average dietary intakes, then you get the effects of somewhere around 20 to 25% reduction in risk. And much of the effects are really what we see coming from cereal fibers. Now in the United States, particularly those cereal fibers, uh, a small proportion of them, roughly about 25%, come from oatmeal, okay? But others, much of which come from wheat products uh, uh, and some of the uh, other whole grain products. This is very consistent reduction in risk. In terms of CVD, we also did one of the first, uh, this is also based on the uh, nurse's house study, fairly consistently showing reductions in CVD now. Uh, subsequently, a total of 16, uh, 11 uh, cohort studies in adults. Uh, again, fairly consistently somewhere about 20 uh, to 30 percent reduction in risk. And much of those uh, supports that come from primarily uh, Caucasians. In the United States, it's Caucasian. In, in, in some of the data in Europe, it's also Caucasians. Move forward with, what's going on here? I know something is gonna happen. Uh, 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 so just very quickly to summarize the, what's the finding. There are in, inverse, albeit not entirely consistent associations of intakes of whole grain, which include oats, uh, with weight gain, risks of developing diabetes and CVD. I think that's a fair statement summarizing the state of affair or of the knowledge in this uh, cardiometabolic space. However, I also listed here some of the key points that I also highlighted roughly about 15 years ago in that editorial published in AJCN. There are large heterogeneities between RCTs and cohort. Obviously, RCT cannot be utilized to look at clinical endpoints, right? Unfortunately, those RCT with clinical endpoints we all agree as a community need to be done. But unfortunately, this period, uh, past 15 years, there's still no study. Uh, and, and all this criticism, you are well known of those criticisms. But something that I do wanted to highlight, and something that I think that we have uh, actually make a little bit of incremental changes, is the fact we did look a little bit detail in terms of understanding the interaction, some of the biochemical markers that have been uh, utilized to capture the interaction effect a little bit better, and how I would say that why is it so important to look at the genetic and genetic and diet interaction in determining the risk of the disease. Now, if you look at uh, a little bit more, uh, I did it on purpose to pick out this study. It's not like this study is any better than some of the study that uh, others have published. But by and large, you see there's a put suggested of a sex difference, something that we or my group have been arguing for some time now, particularly concerning cardiometabolic disease, that uh, all the way from individual case study, from a clinical perspective, Two, some of the prospective uh, uh, cohort studies indicating that uh, women and men just developing heart disease quite differently, and once they develop diabetes, they develop heart disease also quite differently. And then if you look at the data even care more carefully, and this is based on several enhanced data conducted in the United States, even the intake level have this kind of uh, bimodal and now you think a little harder, okay? Much of the prospective core studies are essentially studying this group of people, and, and really f a, a much of the randomized trial are picking up folks like this in their study. So they are not really exactly compatible in, in, that, in that sense. Very quickly, what the data that suggests us show here why we uh, uh, confirm our thinking about the sex differences and then sex steroid axes that are important in the development of cardiometabolic endpoints are a series of uh, investigation now by five prospective cohort studies consistently showing the independent and very much like causal effects of this new biomarker called sex hormone binding globulins uh, that are directly predictive of diabetes risk. In fact, we identified several GM9 mutations that are predictive of the risk of the disease proportional to the uh, uh, plasma phenotype, 
And this, we also see this using the concept of Mendelian randomization, even within the context of a prospective observational study, but presenting the data in a randomized manner because those Gemini mutations don't change, stay with you throughout your life and don't change. And as a result, cannot be confounded by other uh, factors that later acquire in the follow-up. So then we were pretty safe to say that, that the effect that we see is not due to obesity or confounded by obesity or even insulin uh, on the effects of uh, diabetes. So then how can we build in using this marker as uh, yesterday Jeff and I were talking about insulin resistant um, as a marker for insulin resistant but essentially capturing the cumulative effects of interaction, cumulative effects throughout life because you inherited the, those Gemini mutations from your parents but then subsequently acquire all this environmental influence. So by the time that prospectively being documented, those are essentially cumulative effects that can be captured by one single molecule in the circulation, but that those are actually interaction effects. To our advantage, we do have the National Women's Health Initiative, which is the only national study in the United States that was uh, uh, available uh, to us. So I'll very quickly uh, uh, introduce this study for, for us to look at the, uh, the data uh, a little bit more carefully. And this summarized the design of the study that include one prospective cohort plus three different uh, randomized clinical trial. And the data see here very quickly using SHBG as a, as a, as a biomarker for that interaction. We look at this uh, glycemic low, glycemic index, total fiber, total sugar, you can see this kind of dose response effect very clearly. This is the Women's Health Initiative data, data that have not, well, in fact, we just published it uh, in Journal of Diabetes. Same thing when we break down by food group, each one of them, you see this kind of relationship jumping around, particularly uh, uh, for pasta and why the relationship doesn't seem to be as clear in terms of these soft drinks that you can see the effects was actually quite uh, dramatic. So then what we wanted to introduce a little bit to reduce the heterogeneity is utilize the, the, the effect and if you look at some of the uh, analytical uh, statistical analysis that they have done in the past a lot of them, if you look at it in detail, it didn't even do it correctly because there's a statistical adjustments of the total caloric intake not well being done. And in reality, living in the current environment, there's no way someone can actually, a free living human being can actually control their total caloric intake. So what you are doing essentially is looking at a substitution effect. So statistically, we can actually do this to, uh, to do the substitution effect to see replacing servings of oak, for example, re uh, for something else, or replacing whole grain for something else, and, and see the effect. And this is what I'm showing very quickly. Uh, you can see, unfortunately, if you do it like that, there's nothing here for diabetes. There's some suggestive association for roughly about 11% reduction uh, 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 for uh, heart disease and stroke, too. Very quickly, you can see this is the effect that we were able to conf uh, confirm. So pasta, in fact, this is the work that uh, uh, two, roughly two years ago when I started my sabbatical uh, at, uh, at, at Gabriel's place, and then we have extensive discussion in terms of how best to look at this. And this is uh, uh, the latest uh, data. Very quickly, uh, we also talk about network. Ultimately, they are, we are, regardless whether or not you take a, a glycemic centric or dyslipidemia centric or even uh, 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 some of the hemodynamic centric view of hypertension, ultimately they come together to create uh, effects that's of importance. I listed here the critical phenotypes that most of you already know about, 13 of them. But lurking below, ultimately, that some of the critical nodes that govern the network of interactive forces, both uh, from genetic uh, as well as epigenetic and environment, uh, environmental effect. But how do we study them, right? So very few of us actually know how to do it. And again, our group has been one of the first to dive into this and come up with a way 
uh, to do this. The way to do this is that we can go from a bottom-up way of doing that, which you have to use the GWAT to scan the genome, because some of the GM9 mutation that you can identify are stable, constant throughout your life then you can see the system based on some of the SNP mutations to see whether or not there are changes. Another way to do that, then, it's a top-down approach where you can decide a small-scale randomized trial to very quickly to see whether or not the disturbance that you introduce to this network system can actually affect the network. So very quickly, then, I would summarize some of the uh, data uh, uh, in the interest of I think I still have some time uh, uh, to explain a little bit because three, you know, ultimately in our genome, we have about three billion base pair, right? So each one of those, essentially now we can get it as a one single variable, but there's three billion variables then. Then how can you have the data to understand these three billion variables? So there's some of the statistical strategy that we have utilized is first we scan them, not only based on our own data, but the whole world's data available to identify or report it, whatever the, some of those important genes, there are about 409 of them for diabetes. This is using diabetes. But each one of those 409 genes, there's thousands of uh, uh, mutations in them. But we have to summarize in a way that makes sense. Uh, and this is very really quickly that I show you how we summarize them, uh, creating some scores, and ultimately wanting still a logistic regressions because ultimately we wanted to identify the clinical endpoints of whether or not you get diabetes or heart disease, and then you then measure them uh, with this uh, uh, parameter. Now, what's interesting or make it more complicated is the fact that once we created this, we still have to understand the interaction, right? The inter how do you do the interaction? I already say you that a three billion base pair for uh, genetic, then the foot frequency questionnaire can capture about 122 foot items, right? So you further convert that into nutrient, that get you some, but ultimately you still have to want to capture something, the signal that beyond the main endpoint. The main endpoint, it's here, what I show here is essentially we have to come up with what we define this so-called relative excess risk due to interaction. Due to interaction is an additive model that built upon the multiplicative nature of the model because it's a logistic regression. So it allows us to pick up some of the significant effect. Now this has not yet been published, but I can, I still have five minutes. Oh boy, so five minutes for you. So I'm almost done. This is the this is the, uh, this has not been published. We have, we have identified now, um, uh, for the first time, some of the interaction effect that come out that show the interaction, the so-called recessive uh, risk, excessive or recessive risk uh, uh, increase for a set of genes. I highlight here for you to, to see some of the significance. Uh, this one is the gastric inhibitory polypeptides in glucocon family interacting with potato, okay? This is, this is from the National Women's Health Study data, okay? The, the, this is not preconception. We use the model totally picked up by, this, by the model, uh, not, not that we, we have to go after them. This one is the protein in the glucose dehydrogenase family interacting with uh, soft drink. See? Perfect. Uh, and this one is the putative transcription factor involved in pancreas de development and function interacting with beans. Okay, so I can end it there. There's many that we are picking up now, and we are in the process of organizing them. Though my graduate, uh, Dr. Huang is already getting his, uh, her PhD and move on to Harvard Medical School. I'm just eager to get her published this paper. Thank you.